I am Mike Saunders. I wanted to talk to you about an intro to AV and EDR evasion. Thanks again, Jaycon, for making us look good. I am Mike Saunders, hard water hacker on Twitter. It has nothing to do with the mineral content of water. If you live in the Northland, lakes have the season when you can walk on them and the seasons when, if you're not holy, you can't walk on them. I prefer, prefer the hard water seasons where I go ice fishing. So that's where the name comes from. If you want a copy of the slides, they will be at this link that's up here. However, they are not there right now. And if you follow me on Twitter at Hardwater Hacker, I will send out a tweet when those slides are available. So don't worry about trying to take pictures of the screens. Everything will be here other than this one. Get my contact info for sure. So a little bit about me. I am the principal consultant at Red Siege. I've been in IT a while, been in security for a good chunk of that. Uh, when I'm not computering, if you follow me on Twitter already, you realize that I spend a lot of time outdoors and uh, doing some photography. But let's talk about hacking. First, what this talk isn't. As you may have suspected by the title, it's an intro talk. This is not an advanced evasion talk. We're not going to be talking about things like cis whispers and inline whispers and nim whispers and careless whispers. We're not going to be talking about things like that. Thank you. And uh, so we're not going to be talking about unhooking. We're not going to be talking about evading runtime checks for the most time. So the things that you need to do to fool Cobalt, Cobalt Strike once your payload is running, that's the next talk. Uh, we're not going to be talking about things like uh, obfuscating your comms channels so that your beacons don't get caught. This is mainly about while how you get your payloads on disk or in memory, those initial things that are going to get you caught. Most of those kinds of detections are brittle. And so there's going to be ways that we can change our payloads to evade those detections. And I'm going to talk about defeating entropy checks. Does anyone here know what entropy is as far as AV goes? Like how many people know what that is? All right. So there's a couple. Most of you will learn something new, hopefully. So let's talk about the things that will get you caught. Um, these are things that I have learned from my own experience, things like sticking with the defaults. So whether it's uh, a shell code loader that you're downloading from GitHub, whether it's an MS build template that you're using, whether it's a PowerShell script, if it's not something that you wrote, there's a good chance it's going to be stick signatured already. So you're going to have things like variable names and function names. And those type of things can very easily be signatured. So uh, like the MS build technique, how many people know the MS build technique? I know probably a lot of us. I think Casey Smith probably came up with that. Uh, like what didn't he come up with? Uh, but if you're doing the MS build technique, there's a good chance that you're using a template that's based off something known as the 3G student template. So the 3G student template is up here. There's a portion of it. The task name is class example. There's a good chance for a signature right there, an XML file with a task name of class example. In the context of EDR, looking at things that are happening, MS build loading an XML file with a task name of class example, that could be a signature. So changing that, I would highly recommend we change that. There are other things in that template the address that you're going to get with virtual alloc to load your shellcode into is called funk adder. Helpfully, your shellcode is called shellcode. Um, these next three probably aren't signatured by themselves, but if something is looking at them again in context, an XML file being loaded by MS build, immediately following these other variables, that could be a signature. So think about changing those variables. Another thing, if you're doing a PowerShell script, changing comments is still something that could uh, get you caught if you don't change those. This is an old blog, but it still works. I have seen not too long ago a PowerShell script with HarmJoy in it gets blocked simply because it has HarmJoy or it has SubT or it has manifestation. In this blog, this article, the, the author is talking about 
these three lines specifically, this comment in power view is what got him caught. Just the power view comment, not even functional code in PowerShell was, was detected in signature. Black Hills has an article about uh, bypassing antivirus, getting Mimi Cats, uh, the PS1 to work and getting around AV. They talk about some of these concepts in there. Uh, so definitely check that out. Another thing, not obfuscating common code execution patterns. So this applies to scripts, templates, compiled code. This happens to be some C sharp that if you're using something like uh, C sharp, whether it's a compiled one or the MS build template, if you want to use certain functions, you have to DLL import them. So we DLL import from the DLL kernel 32, and I want to use virtual alloc, or I want to use create thread. Defender, if you have an XML file with this in here, this it's all that needs to be in there. If it sees those DLL imports, it will fire a detection, even if you don't use them, just the fact that you have them. So we're gonna talk about how to get around that in a little bit. Another thing, strings. Strings that are in your file can get you caught. So I did a blog, it's down here, about bypassing uh, AV and getting Mimi Cats to run because you know you gotta do that. And so I went through this process of modifying the compiled version of Mimi Cats to get it to work against Windows Defender. And I use a tool called Defender Check. There's another tool called Threat Check. They're very closely related. The way they work is they do a binary search method. They take your file and they split it into two chunks. They submit each chunk for analysis to Defender. If one of those results in a detection, they take that chunk, they split it in half and so on and so forth until they get down to the exact bytes, you know, offset, whatever, these are the bytes that are being detected. So in this case, this happens to be part of an error message. Um, Mimikatz do local, I think it says. So know that the strings could get you caught. Um, help messages, very frequently help messages are signatured. They're easy to write signatures for, but they're easy to get around because we just change those strings. So it's, it's a hassle uh, and it, it seems like, wow, this is, you know, this isn't very elite. Like, no, it's not, but it works. Like you just change these things and brittle detections. Now there's a whole nother talk, many, many talks that can be done on evading the runtime part, but the initial stuff, you need to get your payload on disk or into memory before you can run it. And these things help. Uh, entropy is another thing that we're going to talk about, but we're not going to talk about it yet. But know that entropy can get you caught. So we need to evade. We have a shell code loader. We have an MS build template that we want to run. We need to make it look like it's not malicious. It needs to look like it belongs on the system. So how do we do that? Well, let's talk about some techniques for doing that. This first one honestly really, really threw me a loop when I encountered it. So... Uh, I had a shellcode loader that used a Zor routine with a multi-byte key for uh, encrypting my shellcode. Now, I encourage you to use a multi-byte key because a single, single byte key is really, really easy for AV and EDR to be like, undo that. Hey, there's your shellcode. And your shellcode, if it's not encrypted, is pretty easily detected if you're using something like Meterpreter or a Cobalt Strike Beacon. So you see here found a Trojan in Zor optimized. And that may be a little bit of a hint of to what the problem was. So I'm compiling my code. This loader has worked forever. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work. And like, why doesn't it work? So I use defender check or threat check. I submit it for analysis. And uh, I don't really recognize the bytes. It's not in any strings or anything I can see. So I start removing pieces of my code bit by bit. Pretty sure it's not my shell code because that's encrypted. So maybe it's how I'm allocating memory. Take that bit out of the code. Nope, that's not it. Maybe it's how I'm executing the thread. Nope, that's not it. Pretty soon, the only thing I have left is the Zor routine. So now, how do I fix this? So one common way that you can kind of defeat some kind of analysis checks is doing things like throwing in a sleep so that execution doesn't happen just one after another. 
throw in some delays, throw in garbage functions, um, declare a new variable, add a number to that variable, subtract a number from that variable, add another variable, and then add those two together and so on and so forth. And so I'm doing those things and I'm recompiling my code and then I'm, an I'm analyzing it again. And every time I compile it and analyze it, if you remember back here with uh, Defender Check, it's telling me the offset is at the exact same place and it's the same bytes. So if I'm changing my code and I am getting the exact same detection every time, how is that possible? Shout it out if you know the answer. Compiler optimization. So one of my coworkers suggested this and I was like, that can't possibly it. But the thing is, it couldn't possibly really be anything else. And so what was happening, if you're not familiar with compiler optimization, it will optimize your code. It does things like reduce memory usage, make your code execute faster, uh, reduce the size of your binary. And one of the things it does is it looks at your code and tries to figure out what are you doing and what's the most efficient way to do that. And it was looking at my code, seeing all the garbage code that I threw in said, this doesn't do anything, we don't need it. And it's looking at my Zor routine and breaking it down to a unique set of bytes that apparently using a Zor routine with a multi-byte key is not something that's done in legitimate software because Defender had a signature for it. So I recompiled and I disabled compiler optimization. No threat found. Like simply disabling compiler optimization, the exact same code I was using before now works. So there's a pro tip. When you're compiling your payloads, turn off compiler optimization because there may be optimized artifacts as a result of your code that are already signatured. Even if your specific code has never been written before, someone else has already written it and has been signatured. Talked about DLL imports earlier and how we were going to evade those DLL import checks. Well, we're going to do that through the magic of entry points. These links here are some Microsoft references that talk about what entry points are and how you can change them, what options are available. But let's just take a look. This is a common code execution pattern for using virtual alloc. DLL import from kernel 32. So if you're doing in C sharp, you're going to be doing this DLL import. Private static external endpoint or virtual alloc and some, some variables that virtual alloc takes. This is how you now call virtual alloc to get memory. But we can change that very easily with something called an entry point. So this looks fairly similar. Similar. I'm DLL importing from kernel 32, but I'm specifying entry point equals virtual alloc. The next two things, set last error, exact spelling, those are some options that are available to you. And know that detections are often very brittle. And just changing the order of things can be enough to evade some signatures. So maybe putting exact spelling equals false or true, put that first, or maybe change it to exact spelling equals false because it even does, it doesn't even matter for your case. Play with the, the options. But the other thing that I want to point out here is this, Splendid Dragon. It doesn't have any special meaning. It doesn't do something magic. It's a random word generator that I have that comes up with word pairs, and this is what it came up with. When I want to call virtual alloc in my code now, I don't call virtual alloc. I call Splendid Dragon. And this, this has been a goldmine. Like, I use this all the time. This technique still works today because these detections are brittle, right? They're, they're looking for very specific things and you just need to change a little bit. And it, it's a cat and mouse game. I'll have a loader working and it works for three weeks. And on Friday afternoon, I test my payload. It's good to go. And Monday morning, it doesn't. So now I need to start going through this process. What can I change? So we've talked about ways that we might get caught and we've talked about some ways that we can tweak our code, a couple of things. Uh, we also have shell code that we need to have. And your shell code has specific bytes, no matter what your shell code's doing, 
there are specific bytes that can be signatured when we're talking about things like a cobalt strike beacon or a interpreter uh, payload or some other type of C2 uh, beacon or agent. It's probably certain bytes of that are going to be signatured. They're going to be the same every time. If you're writing your own shell code from scratch, you can avoid that problem altogether. But if you're using one of those frameworks, that's something you're going to have to deal with. So you need to make your shell code look like it belongs on the system. How do we make our shell code look like it belongs there? So one of the ways that we can do that, encrypting it, obviously, uh, encrypting it works. Encrypting it leads to an entropy problem that we're going to talk about in a bit. This next technique is interesting. Uh, if you heard of the Lazarus group, right? They've been around a bit. They've been doing some stuff. So back last year, NCC group analyzed a, a Lazarus group payload, and they found a couple of interesting things. One, not related, but the way that they execute code with enum system locale A, that's an interesting technique that came out of that. So that's an a way that you can execute shell code. So take a look into that. But what was really interesting was that the shell code was structured as a UUID, uh, universally unique identifier, sometimes called a GUID, uh, but it is a specifically formatted string that in theory is unique. It avoids collisions. Like you can map usernames to UUIDs and then you don't have to worry about account collisions. Well, what they did is they structured their shell code as UUIDs and that was enough to avoid detection. So Bobby Cook came up with this tool, Ninja UUID Runner. And as part of that, there's a Python script that will structure your shell code as a UUID. So if you were to use that, it looks like this. This is actually maybe some pop calc shell code or something like that. I'm actually not sure what it does. I'd have to look at that blog again. But this is shell code, but it's structured like a UUID. So these five chunks of a specific length. And because it's structured as a UUID, the system looked like looked at it and said, hey, this is UUID. This isn't bad. Come on in. So that's one way you can do it. Encryption, obviously, is a way you can do it. Reversing your bytes, storing your bytes in your payload in reverse byte order might be enough for you. And then just reverse them right when you need to use them. You can try breaking it into chunks and having multiple variables that you then add back into one. But there, that is problematic because there are specific bytes of shellcode that occur in a specific place in a known loader, whether, again, Cobalt Strike, let's say. Knowing where those bytes are and breaking up the right combination of bytes, it's really cumbersome. Like you can do it, and then that works right up until the next time you update uh, your beacon, and then like, oh, I need to change the structure a little bit. So you can do it, but it's not great. Another technique that Justin Pollock on my team, I don't know if he came up with this, like he told me about it, he tested it, and it worked. He took his shell code and he split it up into two arrays, an array of even and odd bytes. And I'm not talking by the value of the shell code. I'm talking about the position in the original array. So the first byte in position zero, that is going to be an even byte. So you put that into the even array. The second byte in position one goes into the odd array. Third byte into the even, so on and forth and so forth. So now you have two arrays of shell code that contain all your bytes. Very unlikely that's going to be signature. And then you, when you want to use it, you just read back and forth from the arrays to reconstruct the shell code. So that is uh, a technique that you can use and would very likely work for a while. Steganography, something that ransomware groups use quite a bit, from my understanding. If you're not familiar with steganography, it's a technique of encoding data in an image by altering the least significant byte of color data. So you flip these bits in the color data. It doesn't, it doesn't change the picture very much, but you can store an incredibly large amount of data in an image without increasing the size of the image. And then when you need to use it, you either bundle the image with your shellcode loader or you have your shellcode loader go out and download it and then pull the data out. That is a technique you can definitely use. 
Uh, there's also this concept of big integer that sub T tweeted out uh, a while back, and I haven't had a chance to play with it. Have you played with it, Chris? So it's an interesting concept. Big integer is a data type that takes a byte array as a constructor argument. Shell code is a byte array. So in theory, you could store your data as a big integer, store your shellcode as a big integer. And then there's just some few extra steps that it would take to essentially rehydrate that or convert it back to usable shellcode. Again, I have not tried this. So know that uh, it should work because SubD tweeted it out, so I'm sure it works. But I haven't tried it. But it's an interesting exercise for you to try at home. Entropy. This is uh, this is the big part here. Uh, I'm going to add a disclaimer first. I am not a mathematician, so I may not explain this 100% correctly. So please forgive me if I don't. If you are a maths major, this may make you angry. I don't know, but there's a few things we need to talk about. One, entropy. I'm talking about it in the context of information theory. There is also the context of entropy as in the heat death of the universe. We're not talking about that entropy. We're talking about information theory. There's also something called Kolmogorov complexity and a relationship uh, between entropy and compression that we're going to talk about. Again, I hope I explained these correctly. I hope you get the idea. Uh, please just stick along for the ride. So roughly... Entropy is a measurement of the amount of randomness in something. If something is said to be, has more entropy or is higher in entropy, it means it's more random. Something that has less entropy is less random. Now, Kolmogorov complexity tells us that things that are high in entropy are less compressible than things that are lower in entropy. So the more random something is, the less compressible it is. So we can test this. Read in a million bytes from dev u random and try to compress it with gzip and reduce the size by 0.0% because Kolmogorov complexity tells us that very random data is not very compressible. So this leads us to a problem. Very often we encrypt our shellcode as a way of trying to protect our shellcode. But encrypted data is very random. So it's high in entropy. So if you have an AV agent, agent or uh, EDR engine that is analyzing entropy as a means of making to determine whether dermatination, whether or not something is trustworthy to run. If you have high entropy, there's a good chance that it may make a decision that your shellcode loader is now untrustworthy to run. Uh, so this entropy thing also applies to scripts, not just, com you know, compile code, shell code loaders. I told you to change the default variable names and function names. You might first think like, well, easy. I'll just replace all those with a randomly generated string. I have run into AV on tests that looked at the entropy in variable and function names. And when I had a whole script where I'd replaced all the functions and variable names with random strings, it would not allow it to run because it was looking at the entropy that's in those strings. So I would encourage you not to use random strings. Now you can use a single word. Joff Thayer was, turned me on to like, you know, we'll just build a word dictionary and use that. The problem is if you use a single word, there is a probability that the word that you select is a reserved word in the language that you're developing in. This is especially a problem with like VBS. There are lots of reserved words. But if you use two words concatenated together, not a very high probability that that is going to be a reserved word in the language. So that's where Splendid Dragon came from. You could have Splendid Dragon or Obfuscated Diamond or Chris Truncer, Tim Medine, um, whatever. Uh, those things are not likely to be signatured. So know that entropy can be a problem even in scripts. So let's talk more about entropy. How do we lower entropy uh, 
with things like shell code? Well, one thing we know is that languages aren't random. And I'm talking uh, English, Spanish, German. Those things are not random. And we can test this. So I've got an English dictionary here that I compressed. And I was able to compress it by 64.7%. It's a pretty high amount, so that tells me it's probably lower in entropy. But then I compressed a German dictionary, and I compressed that by 75.9%. So that tells me that it's even less random. It has less entropy than the English language. So we can use that to our advantage. There are two uh, really cool white papers here on using, like, written word as a means of obfuscating shell code. Uh, and I, I have a, fu uh, a function that works that a friend of mine wrote, but I, I can't publicly disclose it, but literally think like Shakespeare, you know, um, it's really cool. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about something similar, how we can address this problem, but why are we talking about this? As with everything we've talked about, it's things that I've ran into on tests. So I'm on a test where I am testing against CrowdStrike and they've got the machine learning AV component enabled. I drop my shell code loader that contains AES encrypted shell code and I run it and nothing happens. I don't get a callback, but it also didn't look like it, run, like it ran at all. So like any good developer, I took my shell code or my, my shell code loader, and I threw in a bunch of printf statements so I could tell where it got to. And I uploaded it again, and I ran it. And the first thing that should have done in main was print out hello from main, but I didn't get that. So that told me something on the system has made a decision that this file is not trustworthy to execute before it ever executed it. It didn't analyze it, and then see I was trying to virtual alloc and create thread and kill it. It just said this file isn't trustworthy. So I started thinking about it. And my thought was, I bet this is an entropy check. I've known it's a thing, but I haven't run into it. And uh, I asked some people on the Bloodhound Slack. If you're not there, the Bloodhound Slack is uh, a great resource. Uh, I'm very frequently in the red team and the bypass and the coding channels asking questions. Uh, and so I asked some questions there and people confirmed that they thought it was probably entropy as well. So there are different ways of getting around entropy checks. Uh, one person shared with me that what they were taught was to use cat, the program cat, to cat a picture of a cat on the end of their payloads. Because even images are actually not random. Unless you took a picture of white noise, your image is not random and that has lower entropy. You can also cat a dictionary of words on the end on the end of a program. The reason this works is you've got a shellcode loader that's got shellcode in it and it has highly random data, right? This shellcode that's in there. But your shellcode loader doesn't do much. It allocates some memory, loads in some shellcode, and executes it. So there's not a lot of code there. So the percentage of encrypted data to unencrypted data is, is very high. And that means the entropy is very high and could lead to a detection. So adding in non-random data to your file can allow you to bypass detection. And sure enough, that's actually what happened. I tested it. I compiled in an array of words. I didn't even use them. I just compiled them in. It works. Mind blown. Like, what is happening? Um, and thank Jaycon for this beautiful graphic. Um, so I'm honestly like, what just happened? Like, I can't believe that worked. And this is literally what I did. Unsigned care, anti-entropy, 7,740 words. There's no magic to that number. That is the number of words that was in the dictionary that I had. I compiled those words in. Now, remember we talked about compiler optimization that will optimize unused code out of your program. So I compiled it without compiler optimization enabled. So it didn't nuke this from the program and it worked. And we can take a look at why. The first one is just a standard shell code loader. It's small, 362K. This one, it's 15 megs, like it's big. That's not ideal for a shell code loader, but we only reduced the entropy in the AES encrypted one by 18.4%. So 
discs. So that means we couldn't compress it very much. We compressed the one with the words compiled in by 97.8% because Kolmogorov complexity tells us that things that are less random or more compressible, we compressed the heck out of this. So it must not have a lot of entropy. And that's why it bypassed the engine because the entropy was very low. So I thought about how could we do this? And actually, before I get to that, I, I want to show you one other thing here. Uh, this was a cool one. Silence, I Kill You. It's a blog that came out back in 2019. Uh, some researchers were some, doing some analysis on Silence's buzzword bingo, next generation machine learning AV engine. And they were looking at how they could get around it. And what they found was they extracted all the strings from a really popular game at the time. And actually, they may have analyzed the dictionary and realized that the strings that were in there were the strings from this game. But at any rate, they found that they could add those strings to any payload they wanted. And Silence was like, come on in. This is fine. First, they did it with Mimikatz. It worked. So then they downloaded like 500 entries from... I don't know, malware DB, something. The 500 variants of the newest, latest, greatest malware. And every one of them was allowed to run by simply adding in these specific words. In this case, it wasn't entropy. Silence was looking for specific words, which should tell you there's a research project. If you've got access to a new AV and you want to play with it, Maybe there's a similar thing that you can do for your AV and publish a blog about it. So cool. So I'm thinking about evasion and I'm thinking about entropy and yeah, this worked, but it was kind of janky and it made this gigantic shell code loader. And I've got this encrypted shell code and encrypted shell code is a problem, but what if we could have a shell code loader that didn't contain any shell code? I'm not talking a shellcode loader that used a different file, read shellcode from a different file. I'm talking about a shellcode loader that didn't contain any shellcode whatsoever. So I started thinking about that, figured out how I could do it. So I came up with this tool, Jargon. Thanks to Brandon on my team for coming up with that. Jargon is special words or expressions that are used by a particular profession or group and are difficult for others to understand. A shellcode loader that doesn't contain any shellcode could be difficult for an analyst to understand it at first. Well, scratch your head, what's going on? Seemed perfect. So what if we encode our shellcode as English words? Mind blown, it doesn't have to be English words. As long as the strings are valid string literals in C or C++, you can use whatever the heck you want. We'll use English words for the sake of ease here. So has the benefits. One, we don't have raw shellcode in our payload. We don't have encrypted shellcode in our payload. And because words are lower in entropy, a loader that's full of words has low entropy. So let's take a look at how this works. Most of you probably know if you've worked with shellcode loaders that you can store shellcode as a hex byte, zero X zero zero. Mind blown, you can store it as an int. Like you can have a shellcode array of ints. When someone told me that, I was, what? But it works. So you can store zero instead of zero, zero, zero. So we're going to use this to our advantage. I create a translation table. My translation table selects words from a dictionary. And the only thing that's important is your dictionary has to contain at least 256 unique words. Why 256? Because there's 256 possible values in hex, 00 through FF. So if I have 256 different words in this dictionary, and it doesn't have to be English words, it could be the strings from kernel32.dll. That would be a mind trip. We now do a lookup. We look at a raw shellcode. If the shellcode byte is 0x00, zero zero zero, it's 0. What's in position 0 in our array? The word attending. So 0 is attending 
So it's going to be zero when we come back with it, but we can store the word attending. If it's a one, zero x zero one, we store promptly, so on and so forth. So now we loop through our shell code, looking at all these bytes and we create a gigantic array of words. Like if you're using a COBOL strike beacon, it's a big loader, but eh, it works. Now we encode our shell code. So this happens to be a COBOL strike beacon it's in the translated shell code array. Each of these words represents a byte of shell code. So this is what gets compiled into your program. You compile in your translation table because you need to be able to translate it back. You compile in your translated shell code, which is a bunch of words, and you compile in the translator. There's no shell code in the shell code loader. Forgive me if this is insecure C, it probably is. There's probably a bug in this code. I can tell you it works, but it's dangerous. So the way we translate it back, we take a look, we create a loop. And so this is going to be looping through position zero through the end of my shell code table here. And then for each position in the shell code table, we do a lookup here through our, uh, through our translation table. And we do a lookup and to see, does the word here exist in our translations table at position zero? If it doesn't exist at position zero, increase by one, does it work at position one, so on and so forth, until it finds a match. If it finds a match at index 25, we insert a 25 into the payload variable, which happens to be where the shellcode stored, because why didn't I call it shellcode for you guys? That would have been a lot simpler. But it's called payload. And we insert a 25 because TT index, we're looping through the translation table and increasing by one. We found the match at 25. So we insert a 25 into our new shellcode variable called payload because we can use ints as well as hex bytes to represent our shellcode. Once we have our match, we break out of the loop, go to the next byte of shellcode and so on and so forth until we have completely reversed the words into integers. And when we do this, we have a file that's bigger than if we had just encoded or uh, concatenated the words onto the end of the payload, but it's one tenth of the size of compiling in that array. And when we try to compress it, again, 18.4% for the AES encrypted shellcode, 85.8% for this version. So that's pretty good. Like we were able to compress it a lot. So there's not a lot of entropy in this file, which is good because then we can possibly bypass entropy checks that are using that as a way of making sure it's trustworthy. But does it work, Mike? Well, I'm going to execute it. Hey, I'm translating and I got a cobalt strike beacon. So this technique does work. Like I have used this on an engagement, it works. I will tell you six weeks ago, I was having a panic. Like I was really, really panicking because I wrote a 32-bit shellcode loader and I was exporting 64-bit shellcode from Cobalt Strike. And then in my panic, not realizing that, I'm like, oh, it's gotta be a 32, 64-bit problem. And I thought all of this broke. And I was like, I have to give a talk and my tool doesn't work. Nevertheless, I fixed it and it works. You can see here, we can execute shellcode without ever having shellcode in our shellcode loader. So if you wanna get it, this should be live today. It's at my GitHub, hardwaterhacker slash jargon. It doesn't give you a fully functional shellcode loader. Uh, the Python script will read your bin file and then it will spit out a C file that contains your translation table, the translated shellcode and the loop and throw that into your shellcode loader. And this will work. Now, of course, with most EDRs, they're looking at the means of executing code, right? So you still have to have a way of getting around things that are looking for create thread or create remote thread or whatever it is. Like that's the advanced evasion talk that Chris is gonna give. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm just giving you the tool that gets you past the entropy check. 
Some other cool things. Some of you may uh, have heard of this talk at DEF CON this year. And I, I want to back up. I am not the first person to come up with this idea of using shellcode or using words to represent shellcode. I searched and I could not find tools at the time. After uh, some research, I have found out that uh, uh, Moloch, I think his Twitter handle is uh, Little Joe Tables. Uh, Moloch had uh, a tool that uh, encrypts words, encrypts a binary as words for HTTP transfer. So for transferring your, your shellcode into an environment as words. Uh, Sliver also has a Go routine that does this and it's credited in the GitHub link, just not here on the slides. Um, so there are other people who are doing this, but I hadn't found at the time anyone who had released publicly. I knew of private ones, but I wanted to release this publicly. So I am not the creator of this technique. I was just the first person that wrote a tool that had released it publicly. So just want to make sure that's clear. Something cool that came out of DEF CON this year, how many heard about using emoji as shellcode? Now, I believe this project was written for RISC architecture, not Intel architecture, so it would take a bit of work to get it to work with Intel, but you could have a shellcode loader full of emoji. That's fun. So that's something that you could do. If you use Cobalt Strike and you're not aware of the Artifact Kit, no wonder you're getting caught. The Artifact Kit is now part of the Arsenal Kit, and I have seen in Jank EAV that just recompiling the Artifact Kit will change the signature because if you if you just spit out an exe or a dll those default artifacts that cobalt strike creates are very well signatured simply rebuilding the artifact kit can be enough to get you around especially with just av type things that are just looking at file signature not behavior look at the artifact kit because you can modify the techniques for loading shellcode for encrypting your shellcode, for executing your shellcode. So I encourage you, like you, people talk about Cobalt Strike being dead. Like, I mean, it is very well signature. There's a lot of things looking at it, but it doesn't take a lot of effort to make it look like something different that doesn't have a signature. So uh, there's still life out there. You just need to know where the tools are. Resources, I am not getting paid by Sector 7, but I will tell you, take the Sector 7 Intro to Malware Dev course and the Malware Dev Intermediate course. You will learn about some great evasion techniques that go beyond this, like ways to make it so that virtual alloc never appears in your code, but you can use virtual alloc. So if something's looking for that, it won't see it. If it sees you use it, now that's a different thing. And that's where we have to get into unhooking and syswhispers and all that other stuff. But these are great courses. I would highly encourage you to uh, take that. So if you want the slides, they will be available here. They're not there yet right now. Are they, Jaycon? They'll be there soon. I will tweet. If you follow me, Hardwater Hacker on Twitter, you will see those uh, slides get tweeted out. Also, follow Red Siege. Red Siege, uh, we've got a lot of information we publish. We've got blogs that we're writing. We've got webcasts that we do regularly, plus the Wednesday offensive that happens every week that you should come 30 minutes, 12.30, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, exactly 30 minutes on Wednesdays. It's great. Uh, check out our Discord, redsiege.com slash Discord. Uh, we think it's a great community. We might be a little biased, but we think it's a great community, and uh, we'd love to have new people there come and ask questions. If you have questions, please hit me up on Twitter. Send me a message. I'm Mike at RedSiege.com. You can send me a message through GitHub. Uh, if you look at my code and be like, hey, you've got an error here, submit a pull request. But please take a look at the tool. I hope you can use it in your own tests and get some value out of it. Uh, so with that, that's me. This is us. Thank all of you for being here. I hope that you got something valuable out of this. I have nothing left but time to answer questions. So are there any questions? Yes, sir.
So for the people online, the question is uh, using like a sleep function away as a way of delaying code execution that can be used to evade detection. Sleep is getting detected and very often the sleep function is hooked. So essentially what the EDR does is just fast forwards through it and says what's happening next and catches you. So the question is, what's my favorite way of using sleep without sleeping? Um, a common way of doing it, factoring large prime numbers, um, factoring in a bunch of large prime numbers takes a while. So that gives you automatic delay, plus the computer's actually doing something legitimate. So you're not, you're doing a legitimate function. Another thing that you could do, uh, I have a shell code loader that uses AES encrypted shell code, but I don't give it the full key and I make it brute force the last two bytes of the key. So most computers takes about five minutes between when it starts and when it ends. And the reason that works is a lot of analysis engines will only allot a certain amount of time to look at an executable or look at a process before they were like, okay, this is too expensive, move along. So if it takes five minutes to decode the shell code or decrypt the shell code, that could be uh, an effective way of sleeping. Other questions? Chris, we have a question online. Yes. Duker is asking, what is the most difficult EDR for you to bypass when on engagements? <sighs> what is the most difficult EDR to bypass on engagements? Um, the answer is really, it depends. On any given day, I generally hate to see CrowdStrike. Like, it's a pain. Don't you think CrowdStrike's kind of a pain? But it all depends on how CrowdStrike is configured. CrowdStrike can be configured well, and CrowdStrike can be configured like a sieve. Um, Sentinel-1, the first time I went up against Sentinel-1, Sentinel I was like, this thing is a joke. Like, it didn't catch anything. And then I ran into it on another customer and I was like, I'm sorry, I will eat my words because n absolutely nothing works. Um, so uh, we, whether it's the audience, the clients that we have, uh, the ones that I've seen the most are definitely uh, CrowdStrike does a ton. Um, not from pre preventing me, but from a visibility perspective, the, the Microsoft 365 and Azure Defender and Defender for Identity and that ecosystem, it's pretty easy to execute code against, but it's very hard to hide from. Even if you're able to unhook everything, they can infer a lot of your actions. Um, that is very hard to get around from a visibility perspective. Um, uh, one that I'm glad I don't run into very often is Cisco AMP. Cisco AMP has been a real beast when configured well. It has to be configured correctly, uh, and it doesn't work like that out of the box, but that has also been a real challenge. Uh, but it's it just depends on the day and the week and the technique that comes out. You know, if someone releases a new technique, there's a life there's a, a finite lifetime that you can use that anywhere. And then pretty soon the top tier EDR vendors will catch those, but only the top tier blue teams will deploy those new techniques. So it just depends on where you're at. Uh, and that's not knocking blue teams that don't deploy them because signatures break stuff sometimes. That's very valid. So blue teams, I love you. I come from a blue team background. Don't ever think when I'm talking about things that I think your job is easy. Your job is not easy. Like it's so hard. So keep up the good work. Other questions? No? All right. Well, uh, if you have questions that you didn't want to ask here, you know how to get a hold of me. I'm right here. So thanks.